Thank you for the generous welcome and for what is disgracefully my first visit to the Republic. And it's uh, particularly disgraceful on my part because Ireland effectively paid for my upbringing. My dad, who's an engineer, worked for his entire career uh, for a firm of contractors in London, owned by three Irish brothers. And so it's, it's particularly remiss of me to have waited 35 years to see where the household income originally uh, came from. Uh, I should say that this time last year, I spent a lot of time talking to business people and telling them that there was nothing to worry about in UK or US politics. Uh, I said to all of them, look, these are the two most stable democracies in the world. They'll flirt with the idea of Brexit and they'll play around with the idea of a President Trump. But when the choice becomes real and uh, it's their economic prospects on the line and then their national prestige on the line, um, they'll do the sensible thing. So relax, guys. Don't worry about um, political tail risks. Trust the people. It'll all be fine. So uh, to the CEOs in the room, whatever you do today, don't make any big investment decisions on the basis of anything I have to say. Uh, if anything, you need to use me as a, as a negative indicator. What I thought I would do is, um, instead, of give you a, instead of giving you a shallow overview of absolutely everything that's going on in, in politics internationally, um, I thought I would make an argument and see if it provokes a discussion here and uh, maybe a response from you. It's not the FT editorial view, and it's certainly not the IBEC view, but it's something I wanted to test out. And the argument is that Brexit and Donald Trump are superficially similar political shocks that have entirely different and, in fact, opposite implications for business. Brexit, I think, could turn out to be the worst setback for enterprise and for free markets in my lifetime, whereas President Trump, I think, could turn out to be, at worst, a non-event for business and at best, maybe a, a significant supply side boost for business. And I don't say that because of any political affinity with him, it's just where my analysis um, takes me. But I'll try and dwell on Brexit, which I imagine is, is more prominent in your thoughts. Um, the thing you have to remember is that there is now quite a lot of evidence that Britain is heading for a painful exit deal with the EU uh, in two years' time, maybe a bit earlier than that, maybe a bit later, depending on the negotiations. We already know that the public want the restoration of control over their borders, which they cannot do inside the single market. We already know that the government wants to do international trade deals, which it cannot do inside the customs union. On top of that, you have a prime minister who I think is instinctively more nervous and critical of free markets and globalization than any prime minister we've had since the 70s. She's not a socialist, she's not a, a protectionist, but she is quite a strong social conservative, the kind of person who would trade away a bit of economic dynamism for a bit more social stability and cohesion. It's a very um, Anglican, south of England, sort of home counties outlook on life. It's a very home office outlook on life. She's never done a business-facing job in politics, either in government or in opposition. Um, and it's an outlook on life that I think will manifest in this way. If a deal emerges from the European Union that is bad for Britain economically, in terms of market access, but is something that strengthens Britain's sovereignty on migration and justice and home affairs, I can imagine her signing up to it in a way that I could never imagine a Cameron, a Blair, a Brown, a Major, or a Thatcher signing up to it. So she represents quite a, a sharp, temperamental, intellectual break from the consensus that we've had in the UK all my life, really. When you then look at the other side of the negotiating table, the European side, which we never talk about in London, that's when I really start to worry, 
because the EU has a very clear, rational um, incentive to give us a very bad deal. They cannot afford the precedent to be established that if a country leaves the EU, it ends up no worse off and quite possibly ends up better off because that immediately incentivizes every wavering EU member state to try its luck to reopen the question of membership and that way lies the entire unraveling of the project. It's a truly existential problem or fear for the EU. So I think they're going to drive an incredibly hard deal. Everything I've had heard from my own conversations is that the French have um, the toughest rhetoric, but the Germans are absolutely with them on the substance. So the two most powerful countries in the EU holding a hard line against the UK, I cannot imagine that changing under a President Macron or a Chancellor Schulz if they are indeed um, elected this year. So you've got a population that wants out of free movement, you've got um, a government that wants out of the customs union for reasons of trade, uh, you've got a prime minister who's less sensitive to business concerns than any recent predecessor, and you've got a very tough EU. That adds up, in my view, to a pretty bad deal, um, possibly no deal at all, and a, and a cliff edge in a couple of years' time. And if it were the case that Brexit is just a problem for Britain, then it would be containable. You know, sad thing for my country, a very awkward thing for the Republic because of the economic connections between the two countries that you've discussed already. But not a worldwide existential problem for free market capitalism. Sadly, I think it's not just a problem that's going to be contained in Britain and maybe the Republic. It's a problem for the entire continent. And what I mean is that the, the UK always had a very clear purpose inside the EU, almost without realizing it. And that purpose was to be the voice of um, liberal, pro-business economics. Um, so in the typical EU policy discussion, it would break down into the Brits with their line, which is you know, less regulation, no tax harmonization, deepening the single market, the French with their line, which was much more about a social Europe, and Germany somewhere in between, splitting the difference, maybe leaning towards the UK, actually. And that explains the whole of the past 35 years of the EU's achievements. It explains the single market, it explains the expansion to the East, and it explains the, the smashing open of national protectorates, like civil aviation, which allowed Ryanair and EasyJet and other businesses to get going. I'm not crediting my country with all of that. And it was, lots of countries have pro-market views within the EU, from the Republic to the Netherlands to bits of Scandinavia. But, but for reasons of population and diplomatic uh, tenacity, the UK was decisive at the margins in vote after vote, summit after summit, year after year, in steering EU policy making in, in a direction that was a bit more friendly to business than it might otherwise have been. That is a big hole for the EU to fill. And my worry is that the direction of EU policy making now is going to be a lot less uh, conducive to job creation, to economic growth, and to operating the, kind of, the kinds of businesses that you, that you run. And the way the Germans always, put it, always used to put it was, uh, don't leave us alone with the French two comparably sized countries, radically different views. The French, frankly, have a better diplomatic service, and they worry that now, they worry in Germany that they've lost their great sort of pro-market liberal ally, and the direction of policy on regulation, on taxation, um, on fiscal policy, on borrowing, on everything, is going to head in a different direction. And I wonder, completely speculatively, whether in 50 years' time, historians will look at Brexit as a moment which, yes, damaged the UK badly and caused problems for the Republic, but which also set off a trajectory in European decision-making that is not ideal uh, for, a, for a continent that really needs reform in labor markets and taxation and all the rest of it. So when I look at Europe, the implications of politics for business are pretty bleak. And the way I usually cheer myself up uh, on these matters is by taking a flight across the Atlantic uh, 
and, um, and checking out America, as I did uh, briefly last month. Now, that, it seems like a perverse place in which to seek optimism, given that the president is who he is, and the US institutions are under as much strain as they are. And I can completely understand why there is so much dismay at um, the state of US politics at the moment. But the danger is that the dismay obscures some very real reasons for optimism in America, if you are looking at it from a business perspective, from an investment perspective. It is true that we have a president who is um, hostile to international trade agreements, or at least the trade agreements that have been done in recent decades. And it is true that we have a president who is hostile to immigration, even skilled immigration, if you believe what um, Steve Bannon, his advisor, uh, has suggested. But you also have a president who wants cuts in marginal rates of income tax, cuts in marginal rates of corporate tax, deregulation of various sectors, especially finance and um, energy, where there are big productivity gains to be made, potentially, and a president who wants a massive infrastructure spending splurge. Now, if you think infrastructure is a big deal in Ireland, and especially Dublin, you can just imagine what it's like in the US, a country which simultaneously has the most advanced private sector and perhaps the least, least advanced public infrastructure um, in the developed world. So the infrastructure spend will be welcome on its own terms, and just because of the timing, it could end up being an economic stimulus at the exact moment when the world economy begins to slow down and um, we're due another cyclical recession later in this, uh, in the next few years. That's quite a lot to work with. Potential tax cuts, potential deregulation, um, and an infrastructure investment period. And although it sounds like I'm batting for the guy, I'm, I'm, I'm really not. I just think a cold analysis of all of those potential policies, none of them have happened yet, but those potential policies tells you that the least surprising thing about 2016 was the, stock market, the positive stock market reaction to the election of President Trump. A lot of people were surprised. A lot of people thought the market would dive, that, that uh, markets would worry about the anti-trade rhetoric and the political chaos that he would cause. But for most businesses, trade agreements are a fairly abstract concept, either because they don't trade internationally or their trade relations internationally are pretty good as they are, and they don't need another round of negotiations to smooth out um, economic barriers. Whereas, for almost all businesses, a tax cut, a round of deregulation, and some infrastructure is absolutely immediate and tangible and very valuable. So I wasn't surprised that the stock market uh, did what it did. I wasn't surprised that when I was in America recently, everyone I spoke to, including people who cannot stand the president on a kind of political or cultural level, was actually pretty sanguine about, to be cynical about it, the implications for their bottom line of a Trump presidency. So I won't go on, but the essence of the argument is that if you, too many people, I think, look at the populism that's going on in, in Europe, which has brought us president, which has brought us Brexit and may bring us President Le Pen, and they look at the populism in America, which brought President Trump, and they assume it's the same thing, with the same implications for business. And I think that, that reduces it to a level that's, that's much too simple. These are very different movements with very different attitudes towards business, and the business environments that will result on either side of the Atlantic will not converge, but I think will diverge uh, in the next few years and in the, really in the next few decades, because I'm, I'm particularly worried about Europe. So I suppose to wrap up, the, the bad news is that I'm much more optimistic about that side of the Atlantic than I am about this side of the Atlantic. And the good news is that I am almost always wrong, so <laughs> you can hang on to that as a consolation. Thank you. <laughs>